Bashak, it's always nice when we have a chance to, to chat. And as this year is winding up, I wondered what are your thoughts on what we saw in happening in embryology in 2015? Thank you. Well, the, the most breakthrough topic that I would think would be the vitrification, of course, which has been one of the most attractive topics within the last five years. And I believe it's still one of the breakthroughs in ART, especially for oocyte vitrification. And besides that, there's some novel technologies uh, that will be coming, that will be upcoming. But so far, none of these novel technologies for embryo selection, for example, are available for uh, routine practice. And so how has vitrification, at least this year, changed the way you practice every day? Uh, well, at the beginning, of course, it was not, the technology was not very improved. Uh, so it was only on research basis, but over the time, it became one of the uh, universally very easily uh, applied technology in all the laboratories. And then we started having more clinical validation of the topic, uh, which made people more courageous on trying it in their laboratories. So that's how it spread it out all through the world and, in a very short time. And as, as you think about that, and as we talk to our clinical colleagues, um, what are you seeing changing from their perspective as you're increasing and improving the techniques that you have in the lab? Uh, you mean in terms of vitrification? Yes. Well, at the beginning, well, they, I should say that they were more optimistic than we embryologists were at the beginning because we're the ones who realistically apply the technology in the laboratory. It was more stressful for us, for sure. But by the time when we started using it in routine practice, uh, when we had our self-confidence, it was more easier to convince the clinicians to turn back from slow freezing to vitrification as slow freezing was a very well established technology. So now I believe both parts are very convinced that this system is working like a miracle. Well, when you have that kind of new technology coming up, um, what kinds of conversations do you have with the clinicians? Do they come to you with questions or do they come to you saying, when will we be able to use this? Yeah, sure, of course. It's always the clinician who comes to you first for the novel technology, whatever the novel technology that they would like you to implement in your laboratory. Well, I, I can share with you our perspective. So whatever the clinician asks for us to do it, the first thing would be, of course, a scientific search of what is available uh, worldwide. And then the most important thing is whether it's clinically validated or not. Because otherwise, ethically, I think we shouldn't be using it in routine practice without any clinical validation. So this is how it goes. I mean, we start with some research studies, uh, maybe with some mouse embryos at the beginning. And once the lab feels more confident about the technique, then we move on to clinical practice. And then with conversations with the clin clinicians, if the system works successful. So this is how it enters into our daily practice. And that's such a great sort of picture of how that interaction, that interprofessional relationship really works. Exactly. B because without the embryology side and the clinician side working together and understanding each other, you're probably not going to have as easy a time. Exactly, exactly. That's, that's definitely very true. I mean, the conversation, the healthy conversation between the clinician and the embryologist is a must for a successful center, at, at least for long terms. Bashak, as we look towards 2016 and beyond, what techniques, technologies, tricks that are going to happen in the lab are you looking forward to coming into their own? Yeah. Well, what we seek for success in embryology laboratories has two steps. The first step is whether we're culturing the cells, the reproductive cells, in an appropriate way. Are we doing it uh, in a perfect way to keep the viability of the cell as, uh, as equal to the in vivo? So this is the first step, uh, which I believe we would have a lot of improvements within the next two, three years in terms of culture systems. And the second one is once we obtain the viable cells is a selection, of course. So the second uh, improvement, which I would expect in the next few years, would be on the embryo selection criteria, more objective criteria. Well, and that shows so nicely where the embryologist fits in that timeline of the successful baby, right? So, exactly. so it's, it's making sure you have the right cells, 
you're doing the right things to the right cells, that you have the technologies available so that you can get those cells to the point that then you can say, now we have something to select. Um, are there any techniques or technologies that you think will change that even further? I mean, what, what are you looking forward to have in your lab? Well, uh, I would say that's a difficult question because there are so many novel technologies that we discuss and also during these meetings. But the ones that has the most promising clinical outcomes is, is the one is the PGS technology, the genetical technology, which especially on the genetics part is, is very much improved right. uh, in terms of objectiveness and sensitivity. And the second one would be the time-lapse technology, of course, which is uh, one of the most fashionate topics for clinicians and embryologists worldwide. So over the next two years, we'll see whether these two technologies uh, will be improving our objective embryo selection. And it's interesting because a as you look at those two technologies, they're so different, right? They are. They so, are. so you're looking at morphology and then you're exactly. looking cellularly. Exactly. And, and what's nice is that lets you take two different sets of criteria to objectively validate the embryo. Exactly. Maybe in the future, all these technologies will be integrated into one system. Because, you know, considering the complexity of an embryo, of a human embryo, which dynamically changes over the time of development, most probably what would be required for an objective selection criteria is a combination of the, all these technologies, like the, the omics technologies, the PGS technologies, and time-lapse technologies. Maybe that would be the future for embryo selection. And I think that's a great way to end this interview. Thank okay. you, Basha. Thank you very much.